to the worship of the Main Street Church of Christ. We'd encourage you to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com and you can also reach our website at www.churchofchrist.com. And so we'd like to have our jail chaplain, Brother Eddie Frazier, come and tell us about the jail work. Eddie, how's it going, brother? Well, it's going pretty good. Uh, I know this is the end of the year and I don't want everybody to think that I'm taking all the credit so I want to take a, a minute and just name some of the churches that are involved with the prison ministry. It has grown so, so big in number of men and women, I can't remember all of them, but I know that we have Walnut Hill, Crocker Hill Church of Christ, uh, Greenville Avenue, uh, Mountain View, uh, Cherry Valley, and Cliff View, all involved in the ministry that goes with us on every, every, every Sunday. And the chaplain sent a, an email out, I don't know if I forwarded it here or not, but. Since he's been the chaplain of the Gurney Unit since 2015, with him and Church of Christ, has baptized a total of 2,500 men. Amen. To continue to grow. Y'all just keep us in prayer. Pray for me. I'm still having problems with my throat, but I know when I get in that jail, it won't be no problem. Amen. <laughs> All right. God bless his work. Isn't that wonderful? He has taught and baptized over 19,000 people since leaving here in 1998 and beginning his jail and prison ministry. We uh, are going to begin to study. Uh, we're doing an overview on what is called a seed lesson that I'm going to be teaching next year. And that's a key word is seed. And we're going to study and, and uh, uh, give you an overview of that this morning. Uh, we want to also encourage all of our radio audience out there to make your house, your home, your palace, your shanty, your shack, your your hut, we want you to turn it into a house of the Lord. We want you to be an evangelist and we wanna to try to help establish 100,000 house churches. We want you to get in touch with us, come to our website, go on our website and you'll find all kinds of written lessons. Go out and do like Jesus said, invite the poor, the main, the halt and the blind in and uh, teach them about the Lord Jesus Christ and you can do all manner of things. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul defines a word for us. And this word is a word that we're going to study today. And Paul says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. All through history, God has been talking about one thing, that there's a child, a seed that's going to come, a child is going to come. He's going to come and be born. He's going to be the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, we're going to see. All of the promises made in the Old Testament were made referring to the Christ who's to come. The word comes from a Greek word, sporos. It means one child. And it comes from the Hebrew word, zara, that means one child or descendant. Most modern translations of the Bible, this is one of the problems with modern translations of the Bible. Most modern translations of the Bible translate that descendants, like all of the Jews are God's chosen people. And what I'm trying to teach you today is that it's true that God, the Jews were God's chosen people, but they were only chosen because it was through them that the Christ was going to be born, and it was through them that the scriptures were given to mankind. And so most modern translations just totally mistranslate that verse. Now to Abraham and his seed, or his child, were the promises made. He, God, saith not into seeds as of many, like all the Jews, 
or many, but as of to one thy seed, which is Christ. We go back to the beginning of the Bible. We'll say <clears throat> the Bible opens within the beginning, and it does not mean that there was nothing prior to in the beginning. Because John 17, 24 says that there was love between the Father and the Son before in the beginning. John 17, 5 said the Father and Son had glory before in the beginning. <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 4 says that God has chosen us in Him before in the beginning, before the foundation of the world. And Titus 1, 2 says that God promised eternal life before the, in the beginning. In 2 Timothy 1, 9, it says God's own purpose and grace was in Christ before in the beginning. Without a preface at all, the Bible opens with the teaching that God is the creator of all things. Created, the next word, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word created comes from the Hebrew word bara, that is a verb that means to, to make out of nothing. God, by divine fiat, made the first stuff that was made. Then out of the first stuff that he made, he made everything else that was made. The Big Bang Theory that scientists teach us today, they say that some matter about the size of my thumbnail exploded and made the entire universe, made everything out of this one Big Bang. And if you believe that, I've got some swamp land to sell, sell you. I'm telling you right now, because that's the craziest idea that there ever was in the world. If that was true, where did the first stuff that exploded come from? Well, the Bible tells us the answer to that. The Bible tells us in the beginning, God created the primal stuff that he made everything else from. Genesis 1 beginning in verse 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was out form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So there is the Spirit of God that is mentioned. God the Father, Elohim, which is a plural noun. God the Father, God the Spirit, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, there's the Word of God, so we see the entire Godhead involved in the creation. It is a plural noun, in the beginning, God, Elohim, that's a plural noun, but the verb is singular, bara, showing that the the plural, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, work together in union in this creation. Now begins the creation account in which God creates everything. Then he creates Adam and Eve, and then making a, a law, if you sin, you die. Adam and Eve eat of the forbidden fruit. We don't know what that fruit is, but God in his mercy graciously announces his purpose to redeem mankind. And we get the first promise of the coming seed as we've studied for the last few, few weeks in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee, speaking to the serpent, to Satan, between thee and the woman, between thy seed, and, her, and, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. This has always been and always has been and means a virgin birth. How could the union of any man and any woman throughout history cause to be born he who is eternal? It took a virgin birth for God himself to come in to fl become flesh and blood and become the redeemer of mankind. And so we see this seed of the woman becomes a germ of the whole biblical system that we'll study step by step in this coming year as we see this unfolding plan of God unfolds. And again, you see the definition of that key word in Galatians 3.16, and to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. So that key word seed Every time it means Christ. Therefore were the promises made. And he says not to seeds as of many, as to thy seed which is one, which is Christ. 
In Galatians 4.4, 4, we see when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. At the very right time in history, never before or never after in history, was it the perfect right time. The earth, everybody spoke one language as a second language. Greek was the second language of the world. The Roman world roads had been created to going throughout all of the Mediterranean, and they were open. The highways were open. It was like Europe today. In the European Union, you get in any country in Europe, you can go to all the countries in Europe. It's just exactly like the United States. You get in any state in the United States, you can travel anywhere. Well, that was the way that it was in the Roman Empire. You could travel anywhere. The borders were open, free Roman roads, trade had, and one language. The Hellenization of the world had made it the very right time in history. In Genesis chapter 12, now we see the call of Abraham. All of the world had fallen after the flood, and all of the world is involved in sin and in ungodliness, and one man is willing to walk in God's way, and his name is called Abram. Now the Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from my kindred and from my father's house to a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. God called Abraham, who was a great man of faith, and the descendant of Shem through uh, Moses, uh, through Noah, I'm say, I mean, and uh, the, that the Messiah would be born through him. Abraham heard the call of the word of God. He believed the word of God, and that belief brought upon him corresponding action, and he walked all the way to the promised land. He took a 2,000-mile walk. Such was the kind of faith of Abraham. Saving faith is to hear, believe, to do, and to trust. The call of Abraham and all families of the earth also made a call to the Gentiles in the future. And God has been promising that. If you'll notice in Genesis 12, he said, ending it, he said, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now we go a couple of more chapters to Genesis 15, and God, may, God is talking to Abraham, and Abraham said, behold to me, thou hast given no seed, no child. And lo, one born in my house is my heir, Eleazar, his servant. He had made his heir. And so he, uh, he had made out his will in favor of Eleazar. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This shall not be thy heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thy heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Now look towards the heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Look back at verse 5. And he brought him forth and said, Look now towards heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. This Christ who's going to come this child, this Messiah, who's going to come at the very right time in history is in some wonderful way going to multiply as the stars of heaven and become many, many, many. Although he's one child, he's going to multiply some way. How in the world can that happen? Well, the New Testament tells us, and this is a punchline, in Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 26. For you are all the children of God by faith, and the word there should be the faith. The faith of or in Christ Jesus, and it should really read of Christ Jesus. The Greek there is tis pistios, which means the embodiment of all New Testament teaching. It's not your faith, it's not my faith, 
It is the faith, it's New Testament Christianity, it's everything that the Church of Christ stands for. For you're all the children of God by the faith in, of Christ Jesus. For as many of you who have been baptized into Christ, now I want you to notice that, into Christ, you're baptized into Christ. There are only two verses in the New Testament that tell us how to get in Christ. It's very important that we get in Christ. And so uh, there are only two verses that tell us how to do it, this being one of them. You're baptized into Christ. Here, baptism is used as a synecto key that is just simply one word, meaning many words. You've got to believe, you have to have faith, you have to confess, you have to repent, you have to be baptized. You just can't be baptized. There's no water salvation. You can't just be baptized and be saved. You have to have all of those elements. All of those five fingers make a fist. For you're all, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ to put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. But you're all one in Christ Jesus. You mean women are worth something. Women couldn't do anything back then. You know, women hadn't been able to vote but for less than 100 years. You know, they thought that that'd be the worst thing in the world, let a woman vote, verse 29. And if you beat Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So you see, when you're baptized into Christ, you become Abraham's seed and you become heirs according to the promise. What promise? The promise that God said, and I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and the sand that's on the seashore. You become just another star in this crown that, that Christ is wearing. In 2 Samuel 7 verse 12, we see another famous character in the history of the Bible, King David. And so King David is a man after God's own heart. And he has the ability to be great for God, and he has the ability to foul up. And it's one of these times that he's being great, and God promises him in 2 Samuel 7, And when thy days be fulfilled, and I sleep with thy fathers, I'll set up thy seed, there's this key word again, I'll set up thy seed after thee, that shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. A kingdom is where a king reigns. That's the very meaning of the word. So Christ is going to be a king. Notice verse 14. And I will be his father, God himself, in a thousand B.C. says he's going to be the father of this Messiah, this eternal one who's going to be born. I'll be his father and he shall be my son. And if he commit iniquity, and the word commit, there's a, really a bad translation. It should be translated, if iniquity is counted to him, and our sins were put on Christ at the cross, if our sins are counted to him, I will chasten him with a rod of men, with the Roman soldiers, and with the stripes, the beating, the scourging of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thy house and thy, and, and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee, and thy throne shall be established forever. In Acts chapter 2, verse 30 in the New Testament, it says that David, being a prophet and foreseeing the resurrection of Christ, that he would raise up Christ to sit on David's throne. So Christ is raised from the dead and is now seated in heaven on King David's throne. If we lost all the Bible, and if we had nothing but Psalms 22 and Isaiah 53, you ought to have enough that convince you that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We're going to take an overview today of Psalms 22, and Isaiah 53. There are over 300 prophecies of the Old Testament we're going to study next year. But this is just two of the main ones that mention the seed. Both of these prophecies tell us it's talking about the seed. 
We'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com. There's a thousand sermons on there. You can go to www.mainstreet-churchofchrist.com. There's a thousand sermons on there, audio, video, all kinds of written lessons. Psalms chapter 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, gives us the fulfillment of this prophecy. The prophet in a thousand years B.C. says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And of course, Matthew tells us about the crucifixion and about the ninth hour. Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabatani, that is my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Verse 6, drop down to verse 6 in that chapter. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. Luke 23, 21, and they all cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Verse 7. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip and they shake the head, saying, in Matthew 27, verse 39, and they that pass by reviled him, wagging their heads, shaking their heads, and right, wagging their heads is a verbal parallel. Psalms 22, verse 8. He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. This is the very words of the naysayers who gathered around the foot of the cross. In Matthew 27, verse 43, he says, He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Verse 15, My strength is dried up like a posher to an old piece of clay pot, an old busted piece of clay that has no moisture in it at all. My strength is dried up like a posture, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and now has brought me into the dust of death. In John 19, 28, and after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. What scripture? Well, the one we just read. Said, I thirst. And what did the scripture say? Thou hast brought me the dust of death. For my tongue cleaveth in my jaw. Psalms 22, 16. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Dogs is a Hebrew word, Caleb, that <clears throat> means a dog or a male prostitute, a sissy or a punk used by the Jews as a slang word for Gentiles. When they were speaking about all Gentiles, they referred to them as dogs. In John 20, verse 27, um, they have pierced my hands and my feet. Then saith he unto Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it to my side, and be not faithless, but believe him. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou dost believe. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. Verse 20, Psalms 22, verse 18. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. How do you know, preacher, that you're following these scriptures right? How do you know that this is talking about Jesus? Well, Two inspired apostles tell me it's talking about Jesus. That's how I know. This isn't just something I made up myself. Two inspired apostles tell us. If we just read the Bible in Matthew 27, 35, and they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, casting dice, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. What? Well, it's Psalms 22. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vestures did they cast lots. Fulfilled exactly as the prophet said. Isn't this amazing? Because crucifixion wasn't invented as a form of death until 500 B.C. But this psalm is written in 1000 B.C. 
500 years before crucifixion is ever invented. It's like a picture of the electric chair before electricity is invented. God is giving you in Psalms 22 and Isaiah 53 indisputable proof that all through history this has been a plan. This is God's plan. This is not evolution. This is not happenstance. This is not just something that happened. This is God's foreordained plan. In John 19, verse 23, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was that seam woven from the top throughout, and they said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, the one that we're reading right now, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture did they cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. And so we see the exact fulfillment uh, of this prophecy. In Psalms 22, verse 26, the meek shall eat and be satisfied. Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. The meek shall eat and be satisfied, and they that praise the Lord shall seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Now for the first time in the Old Testament, everlasting life is alluded to. It's not promised, but it's alluded to. Unless you take Job as being earlier. In Psalms 22, 27, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. Verse 29, and all lay that be fat upon the earth. What's going to happen this weekend that Christ is killed? What are all the fat cats going to do? All lay that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All the big shots, all the big wigs, all the fat cats, all the politicians, they're all going to eat and worship. And what was going on that weekend? It was the Passover, a Jewish feast, a Jewish holiday in which people were to eat and worship. <coughs> All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship, and all they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. John 18, verse 28. What about the fat cats? Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas into the hall of judgment. And it was early, and they themselves, the Jews, the Pharisees, and the scribes, went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, that they might eat the Passover. They didn't want to get anything dirty on their hands because they had a feast to go to. They just wanted to get this Christ murdered on the way to the feast. That's all. Now God says the result of them killing the Christ is that all they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, shall bow before Jesus. Mohammed will do it. Everybody will do it. Buddha will do it. All of them will do it. All they that go down to the earth, dust of the earth shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. Paul says in Romans 14, 11, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then let every one of us give account of himself to God. Psalms chapter 22, verse 30. A seed shall serve him. One child is going to come along in history, and he's going to serve God. He's going to be the only one in all of history that ever really served God. The only sinless one throughout all of history. A seed shall serve him. There's that key word again found right here in Psalms 22. And it'll be accounted the Lord for a generation. Really a better word there is testimony. 
verse 31. And they shall come and declare his righteousness to a people that shall be born that he has done this. And so the result of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that the righteousness of God is going to be proclaimed to all the world. They will come and declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. I should be declaring that to you today. Every preacher on the face of the earth should be declaring to you today the righteousness of God that's found in Christ Jesus, that he has done this. In Romans 1, 16 and 17, how do we proclaim the righteousness of God? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, in the gospel, in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Isaiah had told us, as we studied last week, that God himself would give us a sign that a virgin shall conceive. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, and Emmanuel means God with us. Virgin comes from the uh, Hebrew word amal. It's the very right word as we studied last week. All of these liars and, and people in colleges and universities today that try to teach you that it's the wrong word, that it's Bethel law. Just remember that if they can get you to doubt the virgin birth, then there's no reason at all to believe anything else in this Bible right here. If they can get that one thing, if they can get you to doubt the virgin birth, they say, oh, well, that's impossible. But God has been saying nothing else throughout all of history. I read to you last week how both Matthew and Luke assure us that Christ was born of a virgin. Here we find the same thing in Isaiah, 750 years before Christ. Well, how do you know that this stuff was written back then, preacher? How do you know it wasn't written sometime like five or 600 or 700 AD? How do you know that this is really history? Well, we've got copies of all this Old Testament. I'm teaching you out of the Old Testament. We've got copies of the Old Testament from the Dead Sea Scrolls from 200 B.C. We've got copies of Psalms 22. We've got copies of Isaiah 53, both of them from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. A virgin conceived and bear a son. Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. What kind of child is this virgin going to be that's going to be born of a virgin? Isaiah 9, 6. For in us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. He'll be ruler in this kingdom of God that's going to come. He will be king and absolute ruler in this kingdom of God, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful. He absolutely is wonderful. It takes a wonderful God to save a guy like me. Counselor, he's a lawyer. He's your go-between, between between you and God who makes intercession for you to God. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah tells us that this child that's going to be born of a virgin is going to be the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now throughout history, people in his name have come and made war, but they're not God's people. They're not God's people. We're not to make war to conquer the world like Islam does. They're going to conquer the world by the sword, they think. Christianity is to conquer the world by peace. The Romans got tired of seeing Christians eat by lying. After 300 years, it wasn't sporting no more. It just wasn't any fun anymore. Do you know that in the Colosseum in Rome, that they had puke things that, that, that people who got sick would puke, 
and they played an organ to where you couldn't hear the little children getting eaten by lions and all the stuff, people being eaten by lions. You couldn't hear that. You could see it, but you couldn't hear it for the rock music that's going on, that they were really partying down in there, man. And so you could get drunk, and you see somebody all butchered up and everything, you get sick, you just puke in this little puke basin you got by your seat. It's all built in. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13. I'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com. There's a thousand sermons on there. We want you to go on there and, and, and start a house church. Let us help you start a house church. And wherever you're at in the world, you can go out and invite the poor and the maimed, the halt and the blind, and they'll all come and, and worship with you, and you can start a house church in your own home. Isaiah 52, verse 13. Now, in the Old Testament, we are taught that Christ is going to be a prophet, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 and following. He's going to be a priest, according to Psalms 110, verse 1, after the order of Melchizedek. He's going to be a king, according to 2 Samuel chapter 7 that we read about he's going to be like King David. He's going to sit on a throne forever. So he's going to be a prophet, a priest, and a king. Now we see he's going to be a servant. And this idea of a servant passages begin all the way back in Isaiah 42, but we don't have time for that this morning. We're jumping to 52. Isaiah 52, 13. Behold my servant, this Christ, that shall, uh, shall deal prudently, and he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And so this, these words, very high, is from the Hebrew word gaba. It means to make high, to lift up, to rear up, to raise up. So this Christ is going to be lifted up, reared up, raised up. He's going to be very high. In John 3, verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. In John 8, verse 28, and Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am He. In John 12, verse 32, And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw or allure all men unto me. Verse 14, As many of were astonished at thee, his vestige was so marred more than any man, in his farm more than the sons of men. The suffering servant, the, the Messiah who is to come, is going to be beaten and marred more than any man. Verse 15, So shall he sprinkle many nations, and kings shall shut their mouth at him. For that which has not been told them they shall see, and that which they have not heard they shall consider. This word here, sprinkle, is really be sprinkle in Hebrew. It means to be here, to be there, to scatter, to strew the blood and the offerings that was made when the priest uh, took blood and took hyssop and dipped it in the blood and sprinkled it on the mercy seat. He was be sprinkling the mercy seat. It uh, talked about the same word is used to describe anointing the priest with oil, with the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is going to do this and all the kings Everybody is going to consider him because nobody can keep alive their own soul. We saw in Psalms 22, everybody that dies is going to go up here before him. So this is just another way of saying that. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord being revealed? How do you know this is talking about Jesus? Well, Paul tells me it's talking about Jesus. In Romans chapter 10, verse 16, he says, But ha they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So he quotes Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 53, verse 1. To whom the arm of the Lord is revealed, the, the, uh, that last clause of Isaiah 53, verse 1. The arm of the Lord is always referred to as the saving power of God. God is powerful and strong to save. 
so the arm of the Lord, God is able to save you. He can pull you into the lifeboat. I don't know if I could pull you into the lifeboat anymore. I've got so. But Jesus can pull you in. Jesus, the arm of God, the power of God, saving man, is nothing to be uh, 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 taken lightly. In Exodus 6, 6, Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. And so this is the power of God to bring us back and buy us back from sin and ungodliness. Isaiah 53, 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's not going to be like Hercules, like Zeus, body beautiful, He's not going to be like the Greek gods. He's just going to be a common, ordinary human being. As the Hebrew writer says, for such as the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he himself, God himself, he himself likewise took upon himself the same, flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. Jesus has overcome death for us. Verse 2, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. The root of David is mentioned in, in Isaiah 11 to speak of this peaceful kingdom, the church of Christ and the lamb laying down with the lion. For he has no form or comeliness and we see him, there is no beauty that we as, should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and we hid as if it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. He's despised and rejected a man was fulfilled in Luke 23, 21. And they cried, crucify him, crucify him. Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Notice the Messiah is to be stricken, smitten of God. God punished the Christ for our sins. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And a chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Stripes. When they scourged people, the Romans used a flagon, which was a cat of three tails. The Jews had a cat of nine tails. But the Romans would tie a piece of metal. A, it looked like a, a barbell. It was a piece of metal. They would tie a piece of metal on the end of each one of those, each one of those pieces of leather. And so when they hit you with a cat of... of uh, three tails there when they hit you with that thing it would bust you up like a lemon it'd make us bruise the size of a lemon or or in a small orange on the side of you and on your arms and on your back and your buttocks and jesus received 39 lashes from the romans 39 lashes times three lashes is 117 bruises and busts all over his body Scourging often killed people. This beating would kill you and me. Jesus was altogether man. And our chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. <clears throat> Verse, Matthew 27, 26. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So he released Barabbas, the scapegoat, just like you and I get away with our sins. Christ died for our sins. We get away with our sins. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. That's called a parallelism. All and everyone are equal. They balance. 
All we like sheep have gone astray, and we've turned every one to his own way. And so this is just poetic language in which God is telling us how people act. There's no animal in the world that more has more propensity to go astray than sheep and us, humans. For we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, on Christ, the iniquity of us all. Verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. Lambs right now today just lay down and let you cut their throat, where uh, goats just, they raise all kinds of kind. In John 19.10, Pilate said, then said Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not I have power to crucify thee and power to release thee? But he opened out his mouth. Verse 8. He's taken from prison and from judgment, and shoes shall declare his generation, for he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Notice he's taken from prison. That's a, a Hebrew word, oster, that means an enclosure, a constraint, the slammer, the jailhouse. It's just plain. He's locked up. So when he gets through with his trial, Pilate delivers him unto the Roman soldiers. He's taken to prison. That's when they put the crown of thorns on him and mocked him. So he's taken from prison and from judgment. And so if we drop down to Matthew 27, verse 19, and when he was set down, Pilate, on the judgment seat. See, that's the name of the very seat that Pilate sat on. He was taken from prison and from just judgment, Isaiah 53, 8. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. I want you to notice in verse 8, he's killed. He's going to be cut off out of the land of the living in verse 8. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. So he's going to be killed in verse 8, verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked. Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and one on the left. They made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he has done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. The rich man in his death. In Matthew 27, verse 57. And when evening was come, there came a rich man, there it is, rich man, of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. And he went into Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man. Verse 10. Now notice he's killed in verse 8. He's buried in verse 9. Let's look at verse 9 again. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9. They made his grave with the wicked. He's killed in verse 8. He's buried in verse 9. This is written 750 years before it happened, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when he shall make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his what? There's that key word again. He'll see his seed. He'll see his child. God will see his child, the Messiah, and do what? Prolong his days. How do you prolong somebody's days when you kill them in verse 8? You bury them in verse 9. How do you prolong their days? Well, there's just one way to do it. You raise them from the dead. There's no other way to do it. So this makes common, plain sense. God speaks to us in common plain language so anybody can understand it. This is written 750 years before it happened. Prove it, preacher. Okay, no problem at all. 
One Q Isaiah, the Dead Sea Scroll, has been dated to 250 B.C. Paleographically, that means the type of letters and the style of writing that, that was written then, and through radiocarbon dating, it's been dated, that scroll has been dated to 250 B.C., 250 years before Christ was born. We have a copy of this. That scroll is exactly like the book of Isaiah in your Bible, except for one word here in this 53rd chapter. It says, when he sees his seed, he will see light. The first soul that ever God saw that was innocent, completely innocent, God saw light. The apostles said in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, this Jesus has God raised up whereof we are witnesses. And of course it cost them their lives to be witnesses of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Isaiah 53, 11, and he shall see the travail of his soul. God will see the travail of Christ's soul and be satisfied for my sin. Is he satisfied for your sin? I sure hope so. You can do something about that today. By his knowledge, God wants us to learn the Bible. He wants us to study. He wants us to get some knowledge of this. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant, there he is again, the righteousness of God, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. The word justification means that God counts us as if not guilty. It's a judicial ruling in which the God of universe takes all of my sin and puts them on the Messiah and fully punishes my sin so I don't get away with it. And he counts me not as innocent, but he counts me as if righteous. He counts me as if he imputes the righteousness of God to me. He reckons the righteousness of God to me. Don't you want the righteousness of God reckoned to you? It's a very easy thing. You can do that this morning. Isaiah 53, 12. Drop down. Isaiah 53, 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion of the great, and he shall divide the spoils of the strong, because he poured out his soul into death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. In 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How do we do that? Well, turn with me now to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, that which I preached unto you, and at which you have received, and wherein you stand by which also you're saved, if, if you keep in memory that which I've delivered unto you, what if you don't, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he arose again the third day according to the Scriptures. If you believe that gospel, then there's no reason for you to leave here lost. Just march down to front down here. Meet me down to front and have your sins washed away. Amen. If you have sin in your life, you need the help of the church and the prayers of the church. Won't you come now while we stand and sing?